here in a webinar today. We're so glad that you've joined us this afternoon. I just want to welcome everyone and say thank you so much for joining Operation Parent in Tara McGuire this afternoon. We're going to load up the queue um, here. We've got folks coming in to join us. We are super excited about that. Um, don't forget, in the meantime, while we're waiting on that, you're welcome to go over to our website, operationparent.org, and um, go to the resources webinar area and um, tap on and register for our next upcoming webinar. Awesome. It looks like the queue has loaded up really well. Um, just want to let you know we've got monthly webinars posted there at Operation Parent. Um, .org very regularly, and our next one uh, is coming up very soon. It should be posted there um, next week or, or the week following at the very latest. Um, we also know that most of you joining us today are interested in alcohol prevention in teens, and so we've selected our rebroadcast um, to be talking with your teen about underage drinking, and that is the past president of MAD. Mothers Against Drunk Driving um, joined us for that webinar back in December, and we're rebroadcasting it for anyone who may not have seen it. Um, the Power of Parent resources available um, with that webinar will complement um, what we're talking about today very nicely. Operation Parents' mission is to love and support parents by providing real-world information, connection, and most importantly, hope. I just want to take you through a couple of our um, technical components today before we uh, get to introducing Tara. Um, we would like for you to participate today, of course, and you can do that by um, tapping on that orange arrow in the top right hand of your screen. For now, just click on that arrow and open your control panel all the way up. You're going to see about halfway down that control panel the question feature. So um, we'd like for you to participate today during that question feature and know that you can send questions at any time during this presentation and they're going to come to Nikki and I privately. All questions um, are going to be answered at the, at the end of the presentation um, and we look forward to that Q&A section, um, of course, as always. So we've got some awesome handouts lined up for you guys today. We have um, a PDF of today's presentation, the slides from today's presentation. We've got um, Alcohol Pops and Youth. Uh, the source for that was Alcohol and Justice website. We also have sources um, from Tara McGuire's uh, website from her company, as well as um, a list of just additional websites and resources that you might find valuable to continue to dig in and uh, study about this topic. We're going to send you a survey. Um, it's a very short survey. It will only take you about two minutes to complete your um, continued support and just intense encouragement um, in that survey. Keep us going, and we're very um, great with constructive feedback to help us improve uh, this webinar program for you as well. Again, it'll just take a couple minutes, and I promise you we utilize that survey every time. For our attendees with us live today, we do have a certificate of attendance. It's gonna be attached um, to a follow-up email, so just know that the email will contain the recording link as well as the certificate of attendance. Um, give us about a little bit over 24 hours to populate all of that um, information and get it back out to you. Um, but that's one of our most asked questions is, um, are we recording the session and will it be available later? And the answer is yes um, to both of those. Um, so let's see here if I've forgotten anything. I think that takes um, us through the logistics uh, for this afternoon, but to the most important part, introducing Tara McGuire. Um, I am so excited for you to learn about Alcopops from her. She has um, been in the business of prevention for a very, very long time. She's made a huge difference um, in our state of Kentucky in terms of getting correct information and um, partners involved to really make a difference in terms of how people are viewing alcohol and looking at the way um, it's distributed 
and having teens um, think about the marketing of alcohol and um, the effects of, of alcohol as well. And so we met back in the fall when she did an awesome um, presentation for healthy Oldham County um, here in our county. And so I am I'm really excited to introduce her and get going today um, on our topic this afternoon. Great. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Can uh, everybody hear me fine? Yes, the sound is great. Okay, good. And good, um, Tara, good. I'll just let the audience know too, we had <laughs> hoped to also have you um, on camera today, but I don't think we're going to be able to do that based on calling in. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. My uh, my computer, for some reason, I it just would not cooperate uh, today. To, uh, to be able to do it, but uh, but I'm happy definitely to be able to join by cell phone and things, and hopefully no it'll problem. be the same great experience. We are, we're up and running and ready to go otherwise. Good deal then. So uh, this presentation is called Parents Can't Stop What They Don't Know. And uh, it really is about focusing on, you know, the, the engaging world of uh, really just underage drinking. There's all the time new developments, there's product trends, there's all kinds of things that, you know, perhaps young people are aware of, but parents might not be in the know about. So we're going to try to uh, to change some of that, and, uh, and hopefully you all will find it interesting. Go ahead and switch it if we could. All right, so, um, so a little bit kind of on me. So I am the statewide for Kentucky Alcohol Prevention Enhancement Specialist. As Michelle said, they call me the Alcohol Pez for short. It is actually one of five uh, Pez sites that Kentucky operates where each topic's focus uh, in order to be experts within our own field. So mine's alcohol, of course. My site's operated by the New Vista Prevention Center in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we really do research around, uh, around alcohol environmental strategies. We disseminate the latest national research and also provide technical assistance. To, uh, to coalitions, to parent groups, to educators, to youth coalitions, to all kinds of people. And it's all about really reducing alcohol availability to underage youth. So I do have a website, as was already mentioned, and that's kyalcoholprevention.org, as well as two social media pages on Facebook and Twitter, uh, both at KY Prevention. So I encourage you all to check those out. So a little bit kind of about me, I am a graduate of Transylvania University in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I have a background in marketing. I have been in the substance abuse field, specifically working in alcohol prevention now for 15 years. Uh, I am a certified prevention specialist and also serving on the uh, ICNRC or International Certification and Reciprocity Consortium, uh, International Prevention Specialist Steering Committee. I've been recognized uh, as an honoree to the MAD National Mickey Sadoff Award the Kentucky Enforcing Drinking Laws uh, stuff. I've also presented to nearly 75,000 people at more than 400 state, national, and international events as a spokesperson around this topic. So now I guess we'll kind of get to what everybody is kind of looking at. So our learning objectives today, just to kind of review those. So it's how did alcoholic beverages appeal and are marketed to you? How adults can identify alcohol from similar looking non-alcoholic beverages and stay up to date on new trends, products, and concealment and consumption methods. These might be things like powdered and even vaporized alcohol. How to get involved and keep these dangerous products out of youth's hands. And finally, strategies to keep open safety conversations with your teen and ensure that they know your expectations. Uh, that your expectations are no alcohol use before age 21, and how to use you as the parent or the guardian as an out. Uh, give them the facts and uh, many reasons to avoid these products. So continuing on, uh, what are alcohol pops? So alcohol pops I really think of as kind of a prevention uh, industry type term, but they are malt beverages with special appeal to youth to which various fruit juices and other flavorings have been added. So alcohol pops, they've been around for some time. In fact, they've been around since uh, the early 80s at least, but uh, much like the underage drinking culture, they keep evolving with new products, marketing techniques, and even consumption methods. 
So uh, algal pops, they're with youth appeal. Um, so what's the big deal about these algal pops? They're also called clear malt, flavored malt beverages, malt alternatives, ready to drink beverages, or just in flavored alcoholic beverages. Uh, the big deal is that they appeal to youth in unusual ways. So uh, they might be things like bright colors or even sweet fruity flavors, like raspberry pomegranate, gummy bear, cotton candy, uh, cool names like Twisted Tea, Sky Blue, Rick's Mandarin Lime, Four Loco Triple X. And they're even sometimes, this is a new trend, but uh, they're being marketed in such a way to suggest that they're good for you. Uh, these are things like placing vitamins like B6 and B12 in them and labeling the products as all natural or even organic. Um, they're packaged to resemble non-alcoholic drinks that kids like. So uh, an older one that actually I think of that probably some people are uh, fairly familiar with, but MB2020, you, uh, you look at the bottle of MB2020 and it looks very similar to a container of just plain orange juice. But another kind of more recent, uh, you know, beverage would be uh, Tilt. Tilt's an alcoholic beverage, but it's contained in the same green kind of oversized can as the caffeinated non-alcoholic drink, uh, Amp, uh, that of course is a kid-friendly drink. Uh, you know, in with these beverages, and I'm going to talk about some of these instances, but we've even seen cases uh, like the one that occurred, I think, two or three years ago in uh, Richmond, Kentucky. It's an area just south of Lexington, but a youth coalition group. Uh, went in there, a couple of the youth group um, members walked in there to a local filling station in Richmond, and they noticed that um, in an open cooler that there were things like singles of Bud Light Lime, Coors uh, beverage, of course, the beer, and uh, kids' bug juice. And they couldn't really figure out, one, why that there were singles of these alcoholic beverages in a filling station on ice. They were not, by the way, in line of sight of the cashier, so it presented a high opportunity for theft, potentially by underage youth. Uh, and also, you know, why were they mixed in this open cooler with kids' bug juice? So the, uh, the high school youth members, they actually walked out of the filling station, and they immediately, I'm not sure if they texted or they called her, but they reached out to their adult advisor. And their adult advisor actually went back to the same filling station with them that same day. And thankfully, she knew the owner of the manager. And the youth actually got with the owner of the manager. And they said, hey, what is this? This is a bad situation when it comes to promoting alcoholic products to youth. Uh, you know, is there something we can do about this? Immediately when they, and this is frequently what we see occur, uh, immediately when they pointed it out to the owner of the manager, uh, you know, that man said, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that we were doing this. I am so, so sorry. We are going to move this right now. Like this, this display, this will never happen again. So he now makes sure that any alcoholic displays in his store are in line of sight of the cashier or the clerk or some other employee to prevent theft, of course, you know, something very important to businesses. But also he makes sure that, you know, in with, um, his uh, alcoholic beverage uh, type containers and displays, but he's not mixing those out non-alcoholic products, particularly those that are kids friendly, like the kids bug juice. But still though, there's a lot of trends going on with this. Um, so the last thing or last two things that are on there, they're oftentimes priced lower than, uh, than similar looking non-alcoholic drinks. And we're gonna talk about that later as well. And oftentimes sold on the same store shelf. The last thing is they're heavily promoted and marketed online, which is a big thing, of course, with young adults uh, or even youth audiences. So uh, studies have even shown that there is disproportionate harm uh, coming to young drinkers who consume these alcohol pops versus young drinkers who do not consume alcohol pops. Now, this is actually an older study. Uh, it was published in the American Journal of Public Health actually in 2015, but, uh, but the information I think is still particularly relevant. And we have some newer data and things we're gonna talk about a little bit later as well. But I still wanted to bring this up. Uh, they actually found that youth drinkers who consume the alcohol pop versus youth drinkers who did not consume more alcohol per day, they drank on more days per month, and they were four times more likely to binge drink two times more likely to engage in a fight, and six times more likely 
to again end up with an alcohol related injury. You know, I think that when we see uh, when we see data like this, even though it is older data, we're looking at six year old data. Uh, you know, it is still it's powerful, and uh, it's important to kind of keep in mind. So uh, I want to kind of talk about the shift. Uh, some of you all might be familiar, might have heard of the former alcoholic energy drink. Uh, they made news headlines actually in uh, December around 2010. Um, and it actually really started out uh, with an article by Health AIM that was in November 2010 that uh, the drinks came into spotlight after a group of college students from Central Washington University were hospitalized after consuming Four Loco. So Four Loco, uh, you know, it's a common uh, alcoholic beverage, otherwise known as an alcohol pop that, you know, that people are familiar with and things, and they've removed the caffeine from it. But at this time, it contained both caffeine and alcohol. And the trouble with that was that the stimulant effect of the caffeine, of course, blocks the depressant effect of the alcohol. This shuts off the body's warning signs to a person that they might be drinking too much. So in December 2010, the FDA banned seven dangerous caffeinated alcoholic beverages, warning that as used in their products, caffeine is an unsafe food additive under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Now, as a result, even before the federal ban on alcoholic uh, energy drinks, many states even passed legislation to outlaw these dangerous products. These were states like New York, Washington, and even Michigan. But now, of course, we have this ban over the seven dangerous caffeinated, you know, alcoholic products. Still, though, there were more products than that on the shelf. So the other products, what happened is they kind of voluntarily uh, removed the caffeine, the stimulant from their products. But what happened is even though alcoholic energy drinks were no longer permitted, the alcohol industry responded with even bigger serving sizes and greater alcohol content. So uh, for instance, uh, a standard drink, a uh, 12 ounce regular beer, it's gonna have around 5% alcohol by volume. Now, first generation, this is looking back to the 80s and 90s, first generation alcohol pops, otherwise known as wine coolers, super familiar uh, beverage for probably most of you all, the adults on here, but uh, around eight to 12 ounces and five to 8% alcohol by volume. Then we have the supersized alcohol pops that came about after the span on the alcoholic energy drinks. Those were around 2010 to 2014. So suddenly the size bumped up. We've now got serving sizes 16 to 25 ounces and even up to 14% uh, alcohol by volume. Now, fast forward to today, we're now seeing even more alcohol content and even larger serving sizes that are packed into some of these beverages. And, uh, and one of the things that I actually tell parents, because I'm oftentimes asked, well, Tara, can't you just provide us with a list of these beverages? And that way, you know, we'll know what they are and we can, you know, we can be on the lookout for them. All right, so in one year alone, in one year alone, there were actually more than 500 of these beverages that were released onto the market. There's no way possible that I could provide a list and keep it up to date for you. It would have to be released on probably nearly a weekly or monthly basis for all the beverages, the alcohol pops and things that are out there for parents. But what you can do, and we're gonna talk about this more so, but what you can do is whenever you go into a filling station, whenever you go into a liquor store, a grocery store, depending on what state that you're in, um, you know, take a look around where these beverages are sold. And sometimes, to be honest, you're not going to have to go anywhere near the beer cave. Uh, you might, in fact, just be able to walk over to, um, to just the normal place where maybe they keep, uh, unfortunately, the kids' bug juice or the chocolate milk, the orange juice. Uh, one, group, one youth group actually in northern Kentucky actually several years ago walked into a filling station to do another alcohol prevention product, project, and they actually noticed that... Um, that the alcohol pops and the alcoholic energy drinks and things like that, because this was before they were banned, that they were actually being sold in the same cooler as the chocolate milk and the orange juice and other products that kids like. Not just that, but they were literally across from the kids' candy and toy aisle. Again, they approached the manager of this local station, of this local gas station in um, Minute Mart and things. And this place, by the way, was right across from the high school uh, that was in their community. So it was a big place that kids and youth frequented, but they approached the manager or the owner about it and uh, immediately 
that guy literally rearranged his entire store that same week. And, uh, and it's no longer an issue there, even years later. So uh, you can make real differences by just simply making yourself alert and checking out, um, you know, the, uh, the alcohol displays and things in your own community, if alcohol is sold there or in a neighboring community, by being aware of what's on social media and, uh, and just keeping yourself aware in those ways. They're ways that really do work and make big differences. So, um, so then we have these high alcohol content Supersized beverages. So uh, I'll just kind of a, a question, and, and I think that we've got a poll that's going to pop up here. But uh, how many Bud Light 12-ounce beers, 4.2 ounces or 4.2% alcohol by volume, would someone have to drink to equal the alcohol content of one 24-ounce single-serving can of till 12% alcohol by volume? We'll give you guys a couple more seconds to answer that poll question. I see the results coming in. Um, I'll close it up in a bit and I'll share those results with you guys. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close up the poll. Um, it looks like about 20% of you said less than two cans. 61% said two to five cans, and 19% said more than five cans. Uh, Tara, I'm sure you'll have more to share with us about the answer and why that is. Yeah, absolutely. And I wish actually that video would have um, would have worked for this because I love being able to really show you all, um, you know, what what one of these uh, these beverage cans actually looks like. But if you can picture it, 24 ounces, single serving can of tilt, uh, it's literally gonna be about twice the size of your standard 12 ounce, uh, you know, Bud Light. But, uh, but still it's a 12% alcohol by volume uh, for the tilt versus a 4.2% alcohol by volume uh, for the Bud Light. It actually comes in as it would be the can of tilt, the single serving can of tilt would be the equivalent of about 5.7 Bud Light. So, uh, so normally what I do in a typical presentation is, uh, is I've got these and I literally stack it on a table and I just kind of pull my audience and I keep adding one to the pyramid, another to the pyramid until finally I get through and I've got nearly an entire six pack, uh, which is up there. So, I mean, you know, and you're looking at a single serving can because the thing is when someone pops a can, it's not exactly, it's not like a resealable beverage. When you open a can, you typically open it with the intent of drinking all that's in that beverage at one time. And that's why literally these are known as a binge in a can, because I mean, 5.7 .7 drinks in just that single serving size. Uh, that's quite a bit. You know, two of these uh, highly potent alcoholic beverages in just an hour could easily get someone to a potentially fatal blood alcohol level of a 0.30%. That's comatose. That's super, super dangerous. So um, just kind of putting things in perspective for us, I think, with some other beverages that we're familiar with. Uh, so then moving on to, uh, so I said that I'm a marketing person. So, uh, so I'm going to go through kind of the four P's of marketing. Uh, that's kind of a, a standard thing. Any of you uh, business major or marketing major people out there, you'll uh, definitely be quite familiar with these things. But uh, so beginning, of course, with a uh, product that's going to refer to the taste, the packaging, the name brand, name brand association, the promotion, uh, things that are marketed primarily online to the tech savvy teams. Also, the price. That's the third P. They're often priced lower than similar looking non-alcoholic drinks. And finally, placement, otherwise sometimes called position. That's the availability on the convenience stores. Uh, these things are oftentimes sandwiched between non-alcoholic products that kids like. Uh, there's actually a photo that one of my former supervisors, I actually started my career working for Mothers Against Drunk Driving at the uh, Kentucky State Office. And one of my supervisors, when I was working in Frankfort, Kentucky, our uh, state capital, she actually walked into Walmart one day. And I remember that she texted me a picture and she said, you will never believe what is just down the street from our office. 
And the picture that she texted me were things like Jones orange soda and, and grape soda. And I mean, they were definitely kid friendly products, but here in the very center of them, you had these, uh, these fruity, colorful alcoholic beverages. And, uh, and it was just, they were literally sandwiched between these non-alcoholic products that kids liked. And this was in this Walmart store, right in our state capital, right down the street from our office. So, uh, so a lot of things definitely happening. So we're going to kind of just go individually through each of these, uh, the four P's of marketing and kind of talk about some of the things that are going on and some of the, uh, the more recent trends. So one of the uh, fairly recent products to hit the market is called Shift Party Primer. Uh, so product, again, that's your sweet flavors, bright colors, cool names, brand name association. So uh, at 25% alcohol by volume, there is about 3.38 beers in just a single 6.75 ounce yellow and black uh, looking can. So uh, this can, if you're familiar with the, uh, the smaller size version of a Red Bull, so the, uh, the six ounce Red Bull or the eight ounce Red Bull, it's gonna be about that size to kind of put it in perspective for you. So a fairly small looking beverage, but still due to the high percentage of alcohol, it's 3.38 beers uh, equivalent or standard drinks just packed into this one uh, small shift party primer. But uh, the more trouble about it, the thing that really bothers me, and this could quote directly from their website, but uh, it said it's time to shift gears and launch into full force party mode. It won't fill you up and the taste will leave you longing for more. So, uh, so this kind of also goes back to those health trends that I was talking about earlier. So there's a big shift right now in looking for, uh, for products that perhaps are marketed as all natural. Or, uh, or organic, or products that perhaps maybe won't fill you up as much. So, uh, so that's kind of what this is, uh, this is getting at. But still, it's, it's marketed all about the party part. And, uh, and literally, particularly for the women out there, um, it's literally, it's nearly a binge uh, drink packed into just one 6.7 ounce can. So a whole lot uh, right there. So that's just kind of one example of the products which are out there. So uh, moving on still, um, so let's see here, sorry about that. All right, so uh, also talking about the, uh, the sweet flavors and uh, the calorie comparisons and things. So, um, you know, this is the can of Four Loco. Now this is actually one of the cans in which the caffeine was removed. Um, that occurred after the uh, December 2010 uh, ban from the FDA that took place. But uh, for Loco, 23.5 ounce can, so roughly twice the size of a standard beer, that's going to be around 666 calories. That is the equivalent of a full Subway meal, a Bud Light six pack, a McDonald's Big Mac, or even three Krispy Kreme glazed donuts. So uh, now personally, I don't know about some of you all, but I think that I would definitely rather have that Subway meal or maybe those Krispy Kreme donuts. But, uh, but, you know, still, you know, different preferences. But uh, the trouble is that alcohol packs a large number of calories in a small amount of liquid. This can lead to a lot of unwanted extra calories. So uh, there, um, some of you all might remember as a kid uh, making rock candy. I know that I used to, uh, to try this. And uh, it's where you actually take, take sugar and you take a, uh, a straw or a piece of string or something like that. You dip it into a glass. And you take a lot of sugar and you mix it in with the water and you stir it up a little bit and then you leave it. And eventually after it's left, the sugar somehow, it kind of crystallizes and it binds to this string or the straw inside of the glass or the cup. So uh, I actually, I travel around with actually several suitcases sometimes of these different Alcopops and similar looking non-alcoholic products. And uh, I do these presentations oftentimes, you know, in person uh, for folks, but uh, some, one of the uh, products, the uh, a Sky Blue, it was a little miniature container of it, looks kind of like the little airplane bottle that you get, but uh, a little miniature bottle of Sky Blue, it really gave me a clear example of just how much sugar is packed into these beverages with the whole intent that, you know, they don't want them to taste like alcohol. That's not the intent of, uh, of the marketers and uh, the alcohol industry behind these. But, um, but that rock candy, the trouble is, I remember when it would form the sugar, 
you always had to put more sugar in the glass than what you needed because not all the sugar would actually crystallize. So you had to put in more than what you needed in there. Well, this little miniature bottle of Sky Blue, this alcoholic beverage, I guess something about after traveling around the state with these for two or three years and um, having these products in the suitcases, then moving around and uh, oftentimes sitting for months at a time, then going from hot to cold, sitting in my car oftentimes between presentations, um, the sugar inside this alcoholic beverage, actually some of it crystallized into the bottom of it. And when I flip upside down this little miniature bottle of Sky Blue, I noticed that sugar had crystallized, taking up more than one third of this little miniature container. So uh, that really does kind of give you an example of really just how much sugar is packed into these beverages, not to mention the, uh, the alcohol color calorie content. The uh, point to telling you this is uh, really all about how that um, these beverages, they don't want them to taste like alcohol. They're oftentimes promoted to entry-level drinkers. Well, who are entry-level drinkers? Entry-level drinkers are oftentimes, you know, they're your young adults. Um, they're perhaps even people who are under 21. So that's where I think uh, the product, the P of this marketing here, really does come into play. Now, uh, moving on kind of to our next P, but also a little bit still talking about, uh, about product. So product and promotion. Uh, I mentioned earlier that these products are promoted mostly online to tech savvy teens. They're also promoted as, uh, as being all natural, containing vitamins like B6, B12, uh, natural flavors. By the way, not to be confused with natural fruit juices. There is definitely a clear difference there. But uh, so dating back to that December 2010, a lot happened uh, during that month and that year. The Federal Trade Commission also took action to force the removal of the Sparks Alcoholic Energy Drink website because um, they cited undue appeal to minors due to uh, drink recipes and YouTube videos that promoted on the page. Now, uh, I actually took a look at this web page whenever it was still up. And uh, truly, as someone who's been in the prevention field working on things for as long as I have and working in public health, it was appalling to me. Uh, the page actually looked like it was drawn in crayon or colored pencil. And the cursor actually turned into a hand that you moved around the screen. And when I say uh, drink recipes and YouTube videos, one of the videos, one of the drink recipes, actually looked as though it was filmed in a college dorm room. Now, I don't know this to be the case. That was just in the general appearance and how it came across to me. But uh, it looked like a, uh, a young adult looking, uh, looking male. And uh, he had a blender. And he had the sparks, uh, you know, alcoholic energy drink there. And, uh, and he poured the sparks into the blender. Then he took a raw egg and he poured it into the blender. And then he took, uh, I think it was some orange juice, and he put it into the blender. I mean, I, these things, they reminded me of being back, uh, you know, in early elementary school and, uh, you know, and, and playing goofy little games with, uh, you know, with my friends in which, you know, we dared one another to, uh, to drink maybe like orange juice and milk mixed together or, or something like that. I mean, my goodness, even at that time, we wouldn't have ever asked someone to eat a raw egg. That would have been nasty. So, uh, but, you know, these drink recipes, these YouTube videos, these weren't cocktail recipes that you might think of an adult uh, ordering at a bar or a lounge or something like that. Uh, they were things that just really, they looked like perhaps maybe a young person uh, might come up with these things. Not to mention the crayon colored pencil uh, looking page that looked like, honestly, it had been drawn by a small child. So uh, in the clip art and the images that were used on there. So um, these products are also promoted oftentimes on social media to a large extent where sites like Facebook, for example, are supposed to prevent accounts, uh, the under 21s in the U.S., where residents, you know, it's illegal for someone to, uh, to purchase uh, or possess alcohol in most states. Uh, and that the U.S. residents under 21, it's supposed to prevent them from being able to access these ads. But according to some of our youth coalition members, uh, it doesn't always work. And they say that the products do still pop up on their page. My own research has actually discovered on some of these product pages. Take, for instance, the Ford Loco page. Um, note that it has been cleaned up some now. But uh, it was formally founded uh, with our mission statement to get us wasted. 
and it was literally plastered with seemingly heavily intoxicated user posted images, oftentimes identifying themselves as being underage with captions like for loco makes us take our clothes off. One young girl actually, um, she posted back that she was actually, I forget, 17 or 18, I think, years old, or perhaps it was 19 years old, but it was only after another user commented on the photo and said that she looked like she was 12. So uh, there's a lot of stuff really going on with, um, with these products and with the promotion of them. Um, but still, uh, looking again at the fourth P, the product and promotion, and a new product, uh, Hard Seltzers which has really came onto the market. Uh, it really started out in uh, around 2016. It started becoming really popular with the advent of the White Claw uh, beverage. So, uh, but you know, one thing that you might be kind of wondering is why are they so popular? So one thing, they were actually helped a great deal by the pandemic lockdowns. Um, those actually drove consumers more than ever to search out products that they perhaps perceived as healthy alternatives. Uh, to introduce into their lives. So uh, it also targets consumers. These are a couple other new marketing trends uh, that I think that some of these products have taken advantage of, but uh, it targets consumers looking for a healthier, gender neutral alternative. So many of the alcoholic products in the past, they've really, uh, they've geared themselves to one gender or the other. Well, finally then, I think the alcohol industry really started realizing but they were cutting off part of their part of their marketing um, population, part of their target, you know, audience by that, and part of their potential sales as well. And marketing in general, in recent years, it has really shifted, particularly with youthful audiences, to a more gender neutral uh, approach. So the alcohol industry has really started kind of taking advantage of, uh, of some of these new marketing trends. So uh, they're also ready to drink beverages. They're held in convenient cans that are easy to take with you. They're even marketed as being recyclable. Uh, that's two other current marketing trends uh, that are out there right now. But uh, they're lower in calories. That's another big one, White Claws, White Claws and True Leaf. Those boast about 100 calories per can versus your standard can of regular beer is gonna be typically somewhere between 80 and 300 calories per can. So a fairly substantial difference they're fun flavors that might mask the taste of alcohol. And some even say that they don't fill you up as much as regular beers, which could lead to someone drinking more in a shorter amount of time. So uh, looking at um, moving on to kind of that third and that fourth P, but uh, the price and also the placement. So, um, so price, so under Kentucky law and, and many other states, alcohol pops are actually taxed as beer or malt beverages. Uh, this is because in Kentucky, in Kentucky, we tax things by the way that they are made. So um, that in Kentucky puts them in a lower tax bracket than, uh, than hard liquor, meaning that alpha pops cost less than hard liquor, thus they're more appealing to you. Um, I actually had another Youth Coalition student uh, living in actually a fairly small community just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, this Youth Coalition student actually told me that uh, this was, by the way, someone who had done underage drinking prevention. She was a senior. She had done underage drinking prevention for the last three years. She was going into her senior year. So I fully believe this was a young lady really trying to do the right, the right thing. But uh, she told me that she was on her way to volleyball practice in a neighboring county. And uh, she wanted an energy drink before the practice. So uh, she didn't have a lot of extra cash on her, as oftentimes young people don't have a lot of disposable income. So she walked over uh, to a regular energy drink cooler. She said that she was nowhere near the beer aisle or the beer cave uh, at her local convenience store. And she selected the least expensive beverage. To her surprise, whenever she tried to pay the cashier, um, the cashier asked for her ID. Well, she was really confused. And, uh, and she looked at the cashier and she said that she pulled out what in Kentucky is her nice vertical driver's license, which in Kentucky clearly dictates that, uh, that you are, you know, underage. And uh, it clearly stated that she was under 21 years old. And she handed it very honestly to the clerk. The clerk naturally refused the sale because the drink that she had selected contained alcohol. The teen said that she immediately, she said that she just assumed that her face turned bright red and she immediately left the store. She didn't buy a thing. Um, she was so embarrassed. 
that she had unknowingly selected and accidentally attempted to purchase alcohol. But the thing was, this was a young lady, uh, you know, this high school senior going into her senior year that she literally, she walked over to the regular drink cooler where all the energy drinks are kept. Um, she didn't dream that there was an alcoholic drink mixed in there. And she picked out what was the least expensive beverage. So it gives you an idea kind of about just the marketing in general, even outside of some of those, uh, these tax laws that might be in place. Now, uh, in with these tax laws, I do want to mention there are some states out there that uh, they don't tax things in the way that Kentucky does. Uh, there are even some that classify beverages and even classify beverages in the locations in which they can be sold um, by how much alcohol that it has in it. So by the percent alcohol by volume. So uh, Utah is going to be a prime example of actually one of these states that actually they prohibit certain alcoholic beverages above a certain uh, percent alcohol by volume by being sold in places where under 21 can legally enter. But now going back to Kentucky, in Kentucky, since alcohol pops are actually taxed as beer, that means that they're sold in convenience and grocery stores where under 21 can legally enter. This makes them more accessible to you, whereas packaged wine and distilled spirits are sold in only liquor stores and even in pharmacies, uh, typically in single isolated aisles that are typically very monitored and things uh, where under 21s are not legally uh, permitted without a parent or guardian present. So, uh, but still though, she mistaken the drink very honestly for an energy drink, but a clear example of both price and placement when it comes to these beverages. So uh, what I would actually like to do, and I think that we have another poll that, uh, that we're gonna actually utilize with this is figure out, um, you know, if you can tell the difference between some of these everyday uh, products that are out there. So, uh, so what I would like for you to do is to answer this poll as honestly as you can and try to pick out the everyday product that does not contain alcohol. Again, we'll give about 30 seconds for you guys to answer these. We've gotten a lot of participation in these polls, so thank you guys, it's great. All right, a couple more moments. All right, I'll close the poll. All right, it looks like 2% uh, selected hand sanitizer as not having alcohol, 44% vanilla extracts, 11%, I, uh, I won't even begin to pronounce that, the Count Chocula's uh, beer, 16% um, toaster pastry red ale, and 27% the Jelly Belly draft beer can. So Tara, back to you on the answer and why that is. Yeah, so uh, so there are um, the product in there that does not contain alcohol is the Jelly Belly uh, draft beer can with the Jelly Belly jelly beans. So those are actually flavored uh, to resemble alcoholic products, but they do not actually, according to JellyBelly.com, uh, contain alcohol. So, uh, so hand sanitizer, um, you know, I know that many of you, um, due to this global pandemic that is still very much so going on, uh, might be actually carrying hand sanitizer with you. So if you are containing, if you are carrying hand sanitizer, or perhaps you have some sitting out at your desk or something like that, uh, do me a favor and uh, pick it up or get it out for me and take a look at it yourself. So um, the U.S. Poison Control Center um, and their number of calls actually related, uh, this is in recent years, but uh, related to kids younger than 12 ingesting hand sanitizer for a buzz actually increased by more than 400% in a single recent year. So 400%. That was according to CNN in 2015. Um, just dating back to the fall 2020, so, uh, so very recently, you know, a little bit over a year ago, 
our own FDA brought again national attention to the same issue during the pandemic uh, because you know people were using hand sanitizer in uh, in such readily like available amounts or uh, or hopefully readily available amounts. So actually, the um, uh, the distilleries, oftentimes from within my own state, or many of which from my own state, uh, the bourbon industry played a big role into this. And kudos for them for stepping up to the plate for doing it and things. But uh, they actually started producing hand sanitizer uh, during this time, and or during this time of the pandemic. So uh, back in 2020. And uh, the trouble with that was, is parents and some educators and things started actually noticing that some of the hand sanitizer that was being produced by some of these distilleries and uh, or perhaps was even coming in from other nations, that it smelled very heavily of alcohol. But I'm not talking about the alcohol form that uh, actually is the form that should not be ingested. So uh, it didn't smell like rubbing alcohol to them. It actually smelled more like the alcohol that you would drink. So uh, they started noticing this and voiced concern to the FDA. So the FDA actually noticed at the same time, there is apparently an extra chemical or an extra process in the manufacturing of hand sanitizer that uh, is supposed to be added or formulated at this time. And uh, that actually prevents the hand sanitizer from smelling like the kind of alcohol that you might drink, which might tempt someone or fool someone into thinking but that was a product that was safe for human consumption, which it is absolutely not. Um, but still though, you know, even as recent as fall 2020, uh, this really for young people, kids actually ingesting hand sanitizer for a quick buzz uh, or even accidentally, but ending up actually with alcohol poisoning from this has became a real issue uh, once again. So it is something for parents to be aware of. So if any of you all did actually take out the hand sanitizer, that you've got, um, hopefully you can kind of turn that over. It's probably pretty small and actually find on there the percent alcohol by volume that is written on there. So I'm actually holding a container of hand sanitizer right now. And, uh, and my hand sanitizer, it's actually 68% alcohol by volume. So, uh, so it actually contains a very high percentage of alcohol and things. So um, there are some hand sanitizers out there that of course, you know, perhaps they have something added to them that will mask that type of smell so that it doesn't, you know, get that maybe mistaken identity for an alcoholic beverage that you might drink or something. Um, there are other products, like uh, there are some hand sanitizers that are available in the foam, uh, for example. And, uh, and these type products, they're gonna be much harder to, uh, for youth to maybe mistakenly uh, or on purpose to, uh, to misuse in order trying to get that quick buzz uh, off of them. There have also, in uh, the last maybe five to six years, there have been YouTube videos that have actually showed up uh, showing young people how to actually get a, a quick high by actually inhaling the hand sanitizer fumes. So something particularly dangerous, I think, because you know certainly your lungs, they weren't designed to, uh, to really be something that takes in an alcoholic product. But, uh, but the YouTube videos, they show you actually how to, to take a little bit of hand sanitizer, put it between your hands, rub it together, and then actually cuff your hands around your face, and then take a big inhale. You do that several times, and you end up with a quick buzz from this. So uh, this is one of the things that about my presentation that, you know, I do ask that certain parts of this, that they're not shared, uh, you know, accidentally shared with youthful audiences. Because if you don't already know these things, we don't want to give them any ideas. The uh, McCormick Pure Vanilla Extract uh, that I've actually got in my own kitchen cabinet, it has 41% alcohol by volume. In 2015, Dr. Oz actually, uh, he did a special on it. And it was really an alert to parents and a call out for action that uh, kids might be getting a buzz from everyday products like gummy bears and vanilla extract. Uh, gummy bears, of course, being another product. We're going to talk about that one in just a second as well but that kids might be utilizing. Um, Cerealicious Count Chocula beer. Uh, this is a beer product. Uh, it's actually got 7.5% alcohol by volume, so more than your, your standard, uh, standard drink. But uh, in 2015, General Meals also began pairing kids cereal with beer, uh, with ads uh, even put out there and things around it. 
the uh, the toaster pastry Indian style red ale with this. I mean, it makes me think of a pop tart, but it is a beer containing around 7.6 alcohol by vol percent alcohol by volume. So uh, so again, if you chose the Jelly Belly, then you got it right. So congratulations with that. So I want to go ahead and move on um, to really looking at, can you tell the difference? Which product contains alcohol? So we actually have another poll that I think that we are going to put up on the screen. And, uh, and it's really going to be about a couple of test tubes, uh, test tube products. And I'm sorry that I can't actually show these to you, but I'm going to do my best to kind of describe them if I can. So, um, so one of the products uh, is uh, single serving test tubes. Uh, they come in colors like bright blue, red. They come in a little plastic container. The, uh, the other product is, uh, again, plastic test tubes, but uh, they come in a multi-pack, so multiple test tubes, and they come with a, uh, a styrofoam football that can actually be put up there. So, uh, and I think that we've got hopefully the pole that can be put up there, maybe. Hi, Tara. I'm sorry, but we don't have a poll. Um, oh, I'm very sorry. For your, yeah. My apologies. Well, no, that's on us, that. not on you, but we, sorry, we don't have it. That's okay. No problem. I'll just go ahead and describe them. So, uh, so these two products, um, if you can kind of imagine both of them, again, I'm very sorry that I can't actually hold them up on the screen and, uh, and show them to you. But, um, but with that, I purchased actually one of the products, the, uh, the plastic, uh, test tubes at actually a candy store uh, in the uh, the Lexington Mall uh, right here in Lexington, Kentucky. So uh, this is a product that does not contain alcohol. It's a little plastic test tube, does not contain alcohol. Comes in colors like blue and green and orange and it's got a little looking cartoon character on the thing. They come in single serving. They're nothing but just sweet candy for kids. There is another uh, test tube product, and I purchased them in actually a 12-pack from a local liquor store. And uh, these do contain alcohol. They contain quite a bit of alcohol, in fact, in them. But uh, they also come in plastic test tubes. Uh, the color that I chose was bright blue. But again, they come in colors like bright blue, uh, yellow, orange, green, all sorts of things, same way as the ones from the candy store. Uh, the individual test tubes, um, you know, their fruit flavor, they've got the cool names, everything. They've got little cartoon characters uh, on the packaging for the original packaging. But if you were to take a wild guess of which of these products was actually sold with the foam, foam football, I'm guessing that most of you all probably would not select that the ones sold with the foam football uh, were actually the alcoholic product that came from the liquor store. So when I try to imagine which of these products, uh, you know, are looking at, you know, these alcoholic test tubes and who are they marketed toward? Well, so I think of test tubes. Who might test tubes, you know, appeal to? Well, I think of perhaps, you know, a, a chemist. I, uh, you know, someone perhaps working in the, the medical field. I also think of like a high school chemistry lab or, uh, or, you know, those little like kids like chemistry sets and things. Then I think about the foam football and the bright colors and the cartoon looking characters uh, on the packaging. And I think about the name of these products and, and that kind of thing and, and the fruity flavors and that and the amount of sugar that's been added to these products. And again, it draws into question, who are these products marketed toward? And it seems to me um, they're marketed to young people. And, uh, and my concern is they're marketed potentially, that target market population is spilling over into the underage population. So I wanna go ahead and move on to, uh, to really just how can you all, what is the pattern that you can look for, the patterns that you can look for to be able really to, uh, to recognize the difference between some of these products. And uh, because I mean, as I mentioned, there were more than 500 of these products that came out in a single year alone. There's no way as adults, as parents, as educators, that, uh, you know, that you could simply just keep up with all these products, that I could give you a list, that you could somehow memorize this list, and that we could keep it up to date. So there has to be a better way. That better way is uh, three simple tools that, uh, that I've came up with that kind of work for me pretty well to be able to recognize the difference. 
The first one, uh, which I think is one of the most easy, the easiest, uh, that is to really look for the percent alcohol by volume um, or the percent alcohol that is on there. Now, sometimes you look for this and it's going to be super tiny. So uh, typically at this point, I like to, uh, to hold up a can of tilt or, uh, or just simply like a can of Bud Light. And, uh, and even when I'm doing this presentation in purpose, person to actually pass it around my adult only audience and, uh, and actually encourage adults and see how long it takes them looking at this to be able to find that percent alcohol. Now, sometimes it's written very clearly because on some of these products, particularly those that now contain a very high percentage of alcohol, they want you to see it. They absolutely want you to know how much alcohol that it contains. So you will see it big, big letters. Uh, number font right up on the very front of the can, very prominent for you to be able to make out. But other products, it's going to be super small, almost kind of camouflaged in there in the small print. So it can be difficult to find out. Nevertheless, that does mean it contains alcohol. The next thing is going to be the Surgeon General's warning. If you find a Surgeon General's warning on there, of course, it's written in small print. So, and if something is sold as part of a multi-pack, then it might not be on the individual serving. So take, for instance, on those individual test tubes, because those were sold as part of a multi-pack. Still, though, if you find it on there, that's going to mean it's an alcoholic beverage. The last thing, um, this, I think, is really the easiest way or the fastest way to be able to tell the difference, and that is really to look for the nutrition facts. That is, in most cases, but not all going to infer that it is non-alcoholic if you can find nutrition facts on there. Simply put, if that can of Four Loco, if that company does not have to tell you that that product contains 666 calories per can, they're not going to. It's for the same reason as typically when you look at a restaurant menu, uh, you might see very prominent, very healthy, uh, you know, salads, sandwiches, things like that that uh, will display the nutrition facts or at least the calories on there or perhaps the number of carbohydrates or the sugar content uh, of those beverages. But generally, when you get over to, uh, to perhaps that chocolate cake on maybe the backside dessert end of that menu, they're not as often going to tell you that that big piece of chocolate cake that looks so good, how many calories and things that it actually does contain uh, because they don't have to. So, uh, so generally speaking, nutrition facts are going to infer that they are non-alcoholic. Um, there are also, thanks to a ruling by the Federal Trade Commission uh, in the last maybe five to six years, uh, there are also some products such as Four Loco, for example, uh, an alcoholic product, that they now are required to put something on the back of their beverages, the back of their, uh, their single serving high alcohol content, binge in a can type beverages. They're required to post on there very clearly in large print an alcohol uh, facts um, box. That alcohol facts box actually tells you how many standard servings of alcohol uh, that that single size serving or single can actually contains. So it's going to tell you that, for instance, I, you know, that container of pulp, uh, the one that, you know, we did the, uh, the poll earlier and had actually 5.7 was the equivalent of 5.7 standard drinks, uh, or standard, you know, Bud Light, uh, as far as the alcohol content goes. It's going to have to tell you that it's the equivalent, if you drink just one can of that, of drinking 5.7 standard drinks. So, uh, so a very handy, I think, kind of tool. But those are the three very simple ways to be able to, uh, to tell the difference. So uh, moving on, I've talked a whole lot kind of about these four Ps and about some of the newer products that are out there. But uh, I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the risky consumption methods that, uh, that teens are actually putting out there now. So I do ask you with this slide and actually with the next one uh, that you please do not share, screenshot, or even copy this list unless it is strictly for your own use. The reason that I say that is I absolutely would not want for this accidentally to get posted and shared on say social media or text out or anything in which a young person, a person underage, that maybe let's just assume that they're not aware of these trends, that they don't know about these things. I do not, by the purpose of this presentation, 
being to educate you all and to prevent underage drinking, I would not want to give any kind of young person any ideas, anything that they don't already know about. Uh, still, though, I do want to talk to you all about it as adults to make you aware. So uh, on average, it takes families about two years to admit that there is an addiction concern going on within their household. Parents see warning signs, but they might not be prepared to admit that it's my child. Um, you know, we don't, as I said, share this list with you uh, because we don't want it to fall into the wrong hands and accidentally give you any ideas. But um, there are still some dangerous trends that I want you all to be aware of. Uh, first one that you see there is the ice cream cocktails. Uh, ice cream cocktails, they used to be something that was sold at liquor stores only. You might find it at larger liquor stores, uh, chain stores that, um, you know, they, uh, they contain typically a relatively, not a super high percentage of alcohol, but a high enough percentage that, uh, that they actually registered with, uh, typically your alcoholic beverage control and, uh, typically were required, um, you know, for people to show ID when purchasing them. Uh, but you did have to be 21 in order to purchase these products. Um, so these products are still out there. There are, in fact, um, at least a couple of chain, actually, alcoholic ice cream shops that are popping up across the nation. We don't in Kentucky have any of these yet, but, uh, but in some of the more uh, populated states, uh, New York is going to be an example of that. Uh, then you will find some of these products that are out there, some of these new stores that are popping up. And they're literally to get, you go in and you buy an ice cream cocktail. And, uh, and it's a mixture literally designed with that. And, uh, and some of the flavors, I do have some concern with those that they might be uh, particularly appealing to minors. But a trend that we actually had an adult coalition recently recognize in Louisville, Kentucky, this was in the last maybe six to eight months. And um, the, um, the chair over their adult coalition, she said that she was shopping at her local Kroger, a uh, large supermarket there in Louisville. And she noticed that, uh, that there was what I called um, bourbon flavored ice cream or whiskey flavored ice cream. But she said that her trouble with it or her question over it is it was being sold in the same cooler as all the other ice creams. And, uh, and even some products, you know, like fireworks, popsicles. Uh, that were very clearly, you know, targeted to young people. But, uh, but she took a look at it and, uh, and she realized on the ingredients list that it actually did contain alcohol, that it wasn't just flavoring like those, uh, those jelly belly jelly beans that we talked about from earlier. So, uh, it actually did contain alcohol. And then she realized that she said that she asked the clerk whenever she was, uh, she was checking out that you didn't have to be 21 in order to purchase this, uh, this, you know, bourbon flavored ice cream or this whiskey flavored ice cream from her local supermarket. And she was really worried um, that it could potentially give the wrong idea to a young person, kind of like getting them hooked early, uh, going back to some of those kind of brand name associations and things that might be triggering there. But um, so she asked me about it and I did a little bit of research. It turns out that in Kentucky, uh, if something is below a certain percentage of alcohol by volume, which in this case, for Kentucky standards, this product is, that it falls outside of the realm of our alcoholic beverage control and the products that they're monitor monitoring. Not just that, but you also don't have to be 21 to purchase it. So uh, she actually did talk to her local uh, supermarkets and things and get them to actually post a sign uh, on directly on the cooler that at least let people know, hey, this product does contain alcohol. Just uh, just be aware, it's not simple flavoring. So, um, so just kind of being aware that some of these new trends are out there. Uh, another one that's a little bit of an older one, but it has been coming back up some here recently uh, with some overlap with the drug culture, but uh, vodka soaked gummies. So, um, the trouble is kids are oftentimes unaware of the amounts of alcohol in each piece of candy. So they might begin popping gummy bears until that buzz suddenly kicks in or they end up in the ER for alcohol poisoning. So uh, you might be wondering as an adult how if a young person say that they soaked gummy bears in vodka and uh, they brought them into a maybe a school classroom 
uh, how could you tell? Or how could you tell as a parent that a young person had done this? Um, we actually did this little experiment kind of in my office because we wanted to really take a look for them ourselves. And what we actually found is that after about 18 hours of soaking in vodka, the gummy bears generally doubled in size and they basically looked, ended up looking like a really swelled up, sticky, just gooey gummy bear. Uh, if you can kind of picture that. So, uh, so if you see something like that, then you might definitely take a second look with it. Um, we did notice that, uh, that the smell of it, we didn't actually, I didn't personally actually try any of them. Uh, I'm not a vodka drinker myself, so I just didn't really want to. But um, we did notice that the smell of it, that while if you got really close to it, you could maybe smell just a hint of the vodka on it. Uh, but overall, it really just smelled like a fruity gummy bear. So uh, so just, you know, be aware uh, young people are doing this. After about 18 hours of soaking, they really swell up. They'll be about double in size, and they look like a swelled up, ooey gooey, sticky gummy bear. But uh, there is some overlap, as I mentioned, with the drug culture. In November 2017, an Alabama news headline uh, actually focused on gummy bears laced with meth. Sent six kids to the high school hospital, or sent six um, high school students to the hospital. This caught a lot of attention and things. Um, the drugs were actually found, the drugs found in the gummy bears uh, actually turned out it wasn't meth or alcohol. It was actually weed. So it was uh, cannabis or marijuana. So, uh, but still it sent six kids to the hospital. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Whip and Work uh, 40s and Shorties logo. Uh, this logo, it doesn't refer to, of course, alcohol 40s. It actually refers to baking soda used to make meth. Uh, the last thing is uh, vape pens. Sometimes uh, vape pens, they're actually being used to vaporize uh, more than just nicotine or cannabis products. They can also be used to vaporize or inhale alcohol. So uh, going on to um, uh, vodka eyeballing, it's another trend that has kind of caught the eye actually of, uh, of some physicians and ophthalmologists out there, but uh, it involves pouring vodka directly in the eyeball. Um, uh, it passes directly through the mucous membrane and it enters the bloodstream through the veins around the eyeball. The result's a quick buzz. And if done often, this activity can actually burn or scar the cornea. And in some extreme cases, even cause, or even cause blindness. So vodka soaked tampons, uh, that is one that many of you are probably aware of. It's been around for a little while, but it is still, of course, going on. Uh, again, the, the trouble is, that ordinarily, um, when someone actually ingests alcohol, it, uh, a lot of the alcohol is actually processed by the stomach and the liver. In fact, it's around 60 to 70 percent of the alcohol. So the trouble is, whenever someone is soaking a tampon in alcohol and then inserting it, a female, of course, uh, that you are bypassing the stomach and the liver, and that that alcohol is going directly into the bloodstream which can result in dangerous levels of intoxication. So um, vapor teeny or vaporized alcohol. Uh, this is a $35 product, uh, vapor teeny, that is actually sold online. Uh, it's made by a company out of Chicago. Uh, there is no age verification uh, based on their website uh, in order for the product to be purchased. Uh, Dr. Oz actually did a special on it in which he called it a dangerous diet fad uh, smoking alcohol. You don't drink the booze, you inhale it. So is it an instant hangover? Uh, is an instant, an instant um, no hangover and no calories too good to be true? And the truth is that, again, you're bypassing the stomach and the liver. So alcohol goes directly into the bloodstream and through the lungs. So again, dangerous levels of intoxication, especially if abused. Uh, scientists actually say that the swift infusion of alcohol to the brain makes inhalation more addictive than even regular drinking. And in fact, Robert Walker of the University of Kentucky uh, Center for Drugs and Alcohol Research actually informed the New York Times that when you inhale direct alcohol directly into the lung tissue, that it gets drawn directly into the blood supply immediately. So the rapid onset of the intoxicating effect, that it has a very high potential uh, for abuse, even more so than through regular drinking. Powdered alcohol is another trend uh, which is out there. So powdered alcohol was, uh, was a new product that came onto the market in recent years. Uh, it was alcohol in its solid form. 
So uh, it was kind of a relatively new thing, but it was being promoted as something for for hikers and nature enthusiasts that they could take with them. It would be lightweight, and then they could mix the alcohol once they got out on the trail or wherever they were going. Uh, The trouble is that immediately adults, parents, uh, educators, even some legislators, uh, because the product has now been banned in actually most but not all states, Kentucky is one of those, to actually ban the powdered alcohol beverage. But uh, or solid rather, but uh, is that it's alcohol in its solid form. So literally looking at it, it's going to look very similar to the consistency of a pixie stick. And uh, there was a great concern that young people might actually inhale it. And again, that rapid infusion uh, directly into the bloodstream, uh, more potential for addiction, but also uh, a greater potential for dangerous levels of intoxication, especially if it was abused. So uh, the other risk uh, associated with it was the risk of uh, young people uh, concealing it and the places in which they weren't supposed to have alcohol or concealing it from adults. Because, of course, it's not your typical liquid form that you're used to looking for. It is something which is quite, quite different. So I want to also kind of just go over briefly some uh, dangerous concealment methods. So uh, again, please don't uh, screenshot or copy this list. We want to keep it away from youth. Uh, If possible, if they don't already know about it, we don't want them to. So um, Reef, it is a company out of California. They actually formerly made a uh, flask sandal. The uh, sandals held about three ounces per shoe. Uh, They still uh, make another sandal called the stash sandal. Trouble with the stash sandal is it's actually made in kid sizes. Uh, like actually, like there's a little hot pink pair made for a little girl that is uh, that sold, and uh, and the company actually said that company based out of California, they said that it was designed so that if a young kid was walking on say a California beach, and that that child found something, an object that they wanted to pick up and they wanted to take home with them, that they could put it in their shoe in the stash, and that they could take that product home with them. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've been to California beaches, but, uh, but I have been to a few. And honestly, if a young child finds something on a California beach and it is not a seashell, and I'm hoping they're not putting a seashell in their shoe, it's gonna get broken and they'll be very disappointed. But uh, if they found something like that on a California beach, I hope that they're not picking it up or that an adult is surely inspecting it very, very carefully. Um, but uh, young people are actually using it to stash things like, uh, like cigarettes and marijuana, even prescription drugs, uh, directly into their shoe, um, into places like schools and things. You can look for this by literally looking for a bubble on the shoe and, uh, and it'll pull directly out and there you'll find the stash. But uh, you can also purchase uh, tampon flask tubes directly off of Amazon. Um, there are books with secret compartments in them, uh, hollowed out flasks. There are sports bras, even uh, sneaky shorts with flasks, ties with flasks, strap on beer bellies with flasks, uh, even a hairbrush with a flask in it, fake digital cameras, binoculars with hidden flask in there. There are resealable bottle caps that, uh, that you can find as well. So I went to a high school in which uh, many years ago even, we had uh, walk-through metal detectors and even handheld metal detectors. And, uh, and we were searched, you know, every morning with our belongings and everything. And that was just, that was the way of it. But uh, there was very little attention paid if you were bringing a water bottle or a bottle of any kind. And it clearly had a sealed cap on there or a cap that looked like a seal. Because it was just assumed, well, that must be the original water that came in that container or whatever it is, have you. So uh, they didn't even think about alcohol being in there. But these products, I mean, uh, these are syllable caps. They're sold for under $4 online, available to anyone. There are YouTube videos that actually demonstrate for you how to uh, use a shampoo or even a sunscreen bottle and to refill it with alcohol by just simply submerging it in a container of soapy liquid, squeezing it out enough times, in and out enough times so that you empty everything that's out there and wash out the inside. You then replace the soapy liquid with um, with just plain water and you squeeze it in, squeeze it out enough times that you rinse out the soap. And then finally you refill that same bowl or container with alcohol, 
squeeze it in, squeeze it out there, you've refilled the sunscreen or the uh, shampoo bottle directly with alcohol. Um, there is a really cool, actually, project idea that a youth coalition, actually in Anderson, Anderson County, Kentucky, so, uh, so a relatively small rural community, actually came up with that I want to give them credit with. It's actually now being conducted across our state and I think is a really cool idea. But these youth actually set up, they worked with Kentucky State Police, and they set up actually in a room just outside of their school office, a walkthrough bedroom um, that, that parents, educators, and other adults could actually walk through and take a look at. And they set it up right for a really popular uh, home football game, an open house event, and a couple other events that really attracted a lot of parents. And it was adults only that could walk through there. But they literally hid more than 100, working with Kentucky State Police, of course, they hid more than 100 drug and alcohol paraphernalia and concealment items in this bedroom and encouraged adults to go in there and, uh, and see just how many of these products that they could actually find. But, uh, but I think it was, you know, it was a pretty cool eye-opening experience for some of these adults. And that might be a project that, uh, that you might want to consider adapting for your own community to really raise awareness and things. But of course, make sure that the information is only getting out to adults. That's super important. So finally, uh, objective three, what can you do? Uh, how can you get involved and keep these dangerous products out of youth hands? So uh, first one, I think it's really to make legislators and, uh, and local policy members and really the alcoholic beverage control in your state uh, aware of how these products contribute to binge drinking and the need to make them less accessible to young people. Um, second, you can conduct an environmental scan and you can even encourage retailers, uh, like in some of these examples from the filling stations and the youth coalitions entering them and then doing no more than just simply recognizing something was out of place in their local Minute Mart or gas station or grocery store and taking the time to actually go and talk to, um, to the manager or owner and uh and, you know we've gotten great results in our state from uh from just simply the act of just doing that but conduct that environmental scan and encourage local retailers to position these fruity flavored malt beverages away from non-alcoholic drinks uh that kids might like and position them in clear line of sight of the cashier to uh discourage theft and also remove products which promote underage drinking uh a few more success stories um this was actually all the way back 2008, so more than a decade ago, but uh, a nonprofit group in actually Oregon called on Nordstrom to stop selling these reef glass sandals. The president for Nordstrom, uh, after this coalition actually just writing them a letter, actually wrote them back immediately uh, within a short amount of time and said immediately that the flip-flop flask were a ridiculous product and that they would be removed nationwide from all Nordstrom stores and said, we thank you for bringing it to our attention. Uh, there was another case in which um, another adult coalition actually wrote to the uh, the CEO of Macy's department store, and they had actually inside of Macy's found that there was a uh, a T-shirt uh, being sold within the youth uh, clothing section, and the T-shirt it said Cutie, but it looked like the logo of Coors uh, beer beverage, and uh, and they wrote to them. And the CEO of Macy's actually wrote them back and immediately pulled the product from all of Macy's shelves nationwide. So, um, you know, there are a lot of great examples, uh, you know, of just people making positive differences. But of course, in with these environmental scans, you know, don't just think about the, conducting them in places. You can, by the way, find a form for how to conduct these on my website, the kyalcoholprevention.com or .org, kyalcoholprevention.org. But um, don't just conduct them in places in which alcohol is sold. Our uh, youth coalition from actually Lexington, Kentucky, actually conducted their own environmental scan when they were at an icing store in actually Atlanta, Georgia, while they were there on a, uh, on a school trip. And uh, they later found the same thing was being sold in icing store uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Icing, for those of you that don't know, is a branch off of Claire's, which according to their own website, appeals to, uh, to preteens and young adolescents. So, um, but actually they discovered that there were bedazzled flasks and uh, locker decorations that said, keep calm, keep drinking uh, in there. And they said, you know, why are these being sold in the store? So they wrote the CEO of Claire's 
Uh, unfortunately, the CEO of Claire's actually came back and uh, said that Icing by Claire's would continue selling the flask in its 3,000 stores, but that they would post signs at the uh, store counters supporting responsible alcohol consumption. So uh, this, by the way, translated to a translucent uh, label on the very bottom of these products with super small, maybe a font size four uh, print and white text that kind of really blended in, saying this product is not intended for minors under 21. Uh, so not all cases are successful, but most of them for us have been. So again, uh, what can you do? The number four to that, uh, you can also track national trends. Uh, go ahead and switch the slide again if you could. But you can also track national trends, uh, all about the uh, a trend really re going on right now nationwide to deregulate the alcohol marketplace. Uh, the pandemic has um, really, I think, curtailed a lot of this going on. And, uh, and we've seen legislation proposed or even passed. And I think really most states right now, uh, Kentucky has actually passed both of these measures. But uh, there are measures in which alcohol direct consumer shipment and home delivery are being expanded or they're being permitted. Uh, and also the alcohol to go, or better known as the cocktails to go, uh, that that is also, of course, being permitted, not just during the pandemic, but many states are actually making this a permanent uh, state law, even outside of pandemic times. And the trouble is that studies, uh, you know, published by uh, published by SAMHSA, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, you know, recent compliance check operation by MAD Tennessee, uh, projects within the American Public Health Association, these things, they've actually shown that, um, that of the results, like one showed actually, um, it evaluated online sales to minors, and it showed that of 100 orders that were placed by underage purchasers, that 45% of them were received uh, successfully. Uh, it also revealed that delivery age verification was inconsistently used, and when attempted, it only worked about half the time. Uh, in California, they actually recently published in May of 2020, they said that delivery apps are making it easy for minors to get booze. Uh, and so the delivery uh, services of alcohol available through Uber Eats, DoorDash, even Postmates, made it to, quote, almost ridiculously easy for minors to order alcohol. That was according to their state uh, California compliance checks that were done by their alcohol at beverage control. Uh, in Tennessee, they actually conducted 171 alcohol compliance checks on just curbside to-go orders uh, during COVID-19 and the onset of the pandemic. And they actually discovered that more than one third of those alcohol compliance checks conducted uh, actually resulted in sales to minors. So uh, there can be a lot of things going on with that. So make sure that you're monitoring those, uh, those national trends as well. The last thing for what can you do, the number five, is to educate yourself. And I know that it literally, it might feel like a full-time job at times for parents, educators, and other adults trying to stay in the know. But there are ways to make it easier. You can monitor social media, you can search the internet, Amazon, eBay, uh, alcohol branded websites. Uh, you can visit local stores, conduct an environmental uh, scan. Uh, you can remember those three ways to identify non-alcoholic products from alcoholic products. Again, percent alcohol by volume and the Surgeon General's warning mean that it's alcohol. If you find nutrition facts on it, then most of the time it's going to mean that it's non-alcoholic. Um, you know, adolescence is a risky time, and uh, it's a time of heightened risk taking. And the trouble is, as drugs and alcohol enter the picture, that parents might be faced with a unique set of challenges. But that parents, you all can take an active role as you're doing right now by just attending this webinar uh, in learning about the alcohol and the drug culture that's out there, learning about new trends, keeping yourself educated. Uh, you know, I mean, you're doing the right thing already. Uh, but you can also help your kids to do the same. So, uh, you know, adults in the know, that is what we want. So, um, you know, you can do all of these things. And you can also finally just talk to kids. Uh, talking to your parents, there are numerous resources that are available for parents on my website. Uh, so, you know, what can you do? Tips for parents. Um, go ahead and switch the slide again for me if you could. 
So my website, the direct link for parent resources is actually down there at the bottom. And you'll find links to things like the MAD uh, Power of Parents uh, handbook. Uh, like uh, Michelle mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar that I, you know, that this wonderful group hosting these webinars and things has actually has focused on just recently. You can also find resources through SAMHSA and uh, EmpowerParents.org, numerous other uh, tips and collections and things really just put onto one site and one page to try to make it easy for you all. But, uh, you know, research has shown that kids who have conversations with their parents and learn about the dangers of alcohol and drug use are 50% less likely to use these substances than those who don't have such conversations. That's according to SAMHSA. Uh, it's also important to have these conversations early and often. The American Pediatrics Association recommends that parents start talking with their kids about alcohol by age nine. I know that might seem really, really early, but by age nine, start having those conversations because the longer that kids delay, Drinking and drug use, the less likely they are to develop any problems associated with them, with it. That's why it's so important to help your child connect the dots and then make smart decisions about alcohol and drugs. Uh, so what can you do? More just kind of concrete tips for parents. Um, first, you can establish uh, agreed upon consequences and you can enforce those consequences consistently. So if your kids come home drunk or high, don't try to talk to them that night. Talk to them early next morning. Second, you can model behaviors. Uh, so if parents walk in and they say, you know, I've had a really stressful day, I need a beer, what does this teach the kid? So uh, you really do, and I think right now, you know, during the pandemic and things, as our stress levels certainly have increased for very good reason. And also we know from national, numerous national studies that adult drinking has also increased. You know, being cognizant of a parent, as parents of, um, of the behaviors that you do model for your children and the ways that you model for your children how that you deal with stress and things. So you deal with it in healthy ways. I think that can go a long, long way to making a really, really big difference. So uh, third, you can practice those what if situations and even how to say no. That Mad Power of Parents handbook uh, and website, it's got some great tips for you for how to do that. Uh, the SAMHSA webpage as well. Uh, it's got some great tips as well. But uh, fourth, you can get to know their friends and even their friends' parents. So, um, you know, if there is a party or a gathering that's occurring, a sleepover, will parents be present at that party? Will alcohol or drugs be present? You can set a curfew. You can even call the parents ahead of time. Or even better yet, whenever you drop the kids off, get out of your car and go and knock on the door and introduce yourself. That is the, I think, easiest way to confirm adult parents are in the house and you can actually talk to them face to face and really ask these questions which are good um fifth be awake whenever your kids come home um you know let the kid let your kids know that you can be their reason for saying no uh whenever they refuse that alcoholic beverage that you know whenever young people are in that decision or in that put in the face of uh you know of Perhaps maybe like other kids around them, other teenagers around them are drinking alcohol or or maybe they're using drugs or they're taking other, you know, other risky behaviors to be able, those kids to actually say, oh, no, no, I can't do that. Because when I walk in the door, my mother is going to give me a great big hug and she is going to smell for alcohol. And you better believe it. Nothing that I do is going to mask the smell of alcohol on my breath and on myself. So they are going to know hands down. So I cannot do that. Let them know you can be their reason for saying no. Um, you know, sit them down and talk to them. And uh, whenever they come in the house, and if you notice any unusual behavior, speech, or even eyes, uh, you know, note those kind of things. Research further into it. Be extra aware and vigilant. So um, with that, uh, my main message to you all is as parents and responsible adults, we want more for our kids. Don't let underage drinking get in the way of their potential. Be the positive influence. I truly believe this, but uh, you know, great things, they don't just happen. They have to be made to happen. And, uh, and I believe that you all can and will make them happen. So go out and do it. So uh, with that, I will take questions.
Tara, that has that was so powerful. And um, I want to just let you know the entire time we've had a very large audience on with me and it has been a very active chatty question section. Um, so I want to just let you know, like um, coalitions across the country asked um, to us to mention a couple of products that that they've been made aware of. So I'll do that first and then you can um, expand on those if you want to. Um, someone mentioned a product called Party Primer. So it uh, tends to be a, a drink that um, has basically three shots in it um, to begin with. And then um, another participant mentioned that their nephew was at a bar recently in New Orleans and they um, found vodka soaked cigars were, um, were being served in, in that location. And then the last mention that folks wanted to make sure everybody was aware of is um, a product called Eat Your Drink. And it's pre-made alcoholic gummies and they don't look um, soaked, but they're marketed to younger drinkers um, pretty heavily right now on social media. Um, so wow. let me also... Oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. My no, apologies. go go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to let you know people I, wanted to yeah. make sure we mentioned those broadly. I am just really amazed. I did not know about the eat your drink uh, out there. So, uh, you know, I mean, I that's just a prime example of, you know, really just like you all, uh, you know, I'm learning all the time about what products, you know, are out there on the scene and things. And I think that what is so great, you know, for uh, prevention folks, but also just, uh, you know, for parents and for adults in general, that we really do, we come together through places like this and we can share information and things like that. Uh, you know, the vodka soaked cigars, that, that one does not actually surprise me because it's, again, it's kind of like the caffeinated alcoholic beverages, uh, you know, that were removed from the market. It's the stimulant plus the depressant. So it's masking uh, some of the, the normal signs of the intoxication and things. Uh, and making for a little bit different of an impact. So, uh, and uh, the party primer, uh, the shift party primer, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It is literally three shots in one drink. It's 3.38 beers uh, packed or standard drinks packed into 6.75 ounces of just, you know, a small can, 25% alcohol by volume. So, uh, so it's a lot, definitely. Oh my goodness. That, that is so much. And like, like you said, you know, we're all learning something new. I, I wrote down four new things that you said today, um, that I'm, I'm going to take heed of. And we heard that, um, over and over through the question section, folks were thankful for all of the information you put together and, um, the new information. A middle school teacher just said, um, reminding us generally your children um, are who they hang hang out with and so I'm glad um, that you reminded us to be very vigilant about uh, drop-offs and um, meeting families and knowing exactly what our teens are up to. Um, can you tell us if powdered alcohol is uh, popular right now or being utilized? Are you hearing much about that? So the thing about the um, the powdered alcohol is that it has actually at this point been really banned in actually most states. So uh, so with that, and it was actually banned in most states um, before actually um, it was able to really come onto the market. So um, you know, with that, it really didn't grow. I don't think in popularity to nearly the extent that it perhaps could have. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's still, it's, it's quite, quite dangerous and things, uh, to be out there. So, uh, and I mean, I, I am not actually in a state in which I think that our only state that last I checked, uh, that had not actually put a ban on the product was, uh, perhaps maybe West Virginia. And, uh, and that actually might be old information. They might've actually put a ban in there by now. I, I'm really not sure. But uh, so I am actually not familiar with uh, the degree um, that that product might have actually came into some states that didn't put the ban in there. But um, but they are most states at this point actually did ban the product. OK, awesome to know. Um, someone else in the audience also asked um, us to share broadly that a lot of the hookah bases right now are being filled with alcohol. 
um, instead of water. So that's wow. also very scary. Yeah, absolutely. It most certainly is quite so. Um, well, I'll I'll offer if anybody has a closing question they want to put in the question feature to go ahead and do that. We've got a couple of closing slides that we're going to go through um, for Operation Parent. But before I do that, again, Tara, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and experience and being willing to be with us today and share it. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for hosting the webinar. You bet. So as we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, Operation Parents Mission, um, I'm sorry, Operation Parent is a parent-driven organization providing comprehensive prevention, education, and support resources for parents, caregivers, and organizations responsible for raising and guiding teens and preteens. Um, we'd like to let you know if you um, already are a proud owner of our Operation Parent Handbook. If you wanted to flip to pages 23 to 27 to discuss further with your teen um, uh, and make them more aware of uh, situations with alcohol, there's some great resources, some additional websites, and just a really good base um, to keep that conversation going with your, your teen and set your expectations with them very clearly. Um, we also wanted to let you know we've got a very uh, special offer today, one that we've not done before. So if you haven't been able to get a copy of the Operation Parent Handbook, but you've always wanted one, um, and I would expect that you especially want one after hearing all the information that Tara put together for us today. Um, we've not done this offer before. It's a new one. It's um, buy one, get one free. And that's for our middle and high school edition. You just go online and order one copy, and we will place um, an additional copy there um, as we mail it to you. So we hope that you would order one and share with a family member or a friend. Um, this is a quick turnaround, so um, this ends on August the 12th, so it's something um, that you're interested in. Go ahead and maybe do that this evening um, or sometime tomorrow. And also, um, if you're interested in ordering a bulk order of your handbooks, we have 10% off of 50 and 20% off of 100. Um, so you would need to um, contact the info at operationparent.org if you're interested in a bulk order and a discount on that. And um, that offer goes through September the 29th. I'm just reminding you that we will post our next um, monthly webinar very soon at operationparent.org. And we hope since so many of you are um, interested in the rebroadcast that you'll join us uh, for talking with your teens about underage drinking, a webinar that we put together back in December um, with the national president of um, MAD, Helen Witte, at the time. She uh, retired shortly after she did that webinar with us. But it's a really great one, and I hope that you'll tune in and, and take a look at that as well. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. If you feel so moved, um, we offer the webinar program as a free service. And so if this has been helpful for you and you feel called um, to maybe donate, you can do that on the bright blue uh, button on our website as well. We'd love for you to join our very active and supportive social media community. You can catch, catch us on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, we're gonna double check the queue for maybe one final question. Okay, someone's asking, um, could we do this webinar again? So we can certainly try and do that. I was already thinking as we were going, um, there, there's probably an opportunity uh, for a, a part two of this already. There's so much information and, and we know, um, like as you told us, Tara, you can't even really provide a list of products because the products change um, so quickly. 
Exactly. Yeah, they are constantly, uh, constantly changing and new trends are coming out there. So it's, it's definitely something that you have to continually be aware of and, uh, and stay updated on. That is so true. And if you're, if you're willing to do a part two with us down the road, we'll certainly uh, take you up on that. Yeah, we can, uh, we can absolutely set that up. So no problem. Thank you for your time today. And we want to thank everybody uh, for joining us and we will uh, be back soon.